All right, welcome back to our set at Bookview Now, Javits Center, New York, Book Expo America. This is hour four of our live stream coverage. I'm Rich Folley. Our next guest is Jonathan Evison. Jonathan is a, a great author, author of a number of great books all about Lulu, West of Here, The Revised Fundamentals of Caregiving, which is being made into a movie starring Paul Rudd, and most recently, This Is Your Life, Harriet Chance. Spending time with Jonathan is always a whirlwind, whirling dervish experience. He's got a lot of uh, thoughts that move really quickly. One of my favorite authors to talk to. His new book, This Is Your Life, Harriet Chance, takes his protagonist in an entirely different direction than any previous book. We were lucky to talk to him yesterday. Here's that interview right now. Jonathan Evison, the new book, This Is Your Life, Harriet Chance. We're at Book Expo America. So good to have you here. So great to have you yeah. here with me. <laughs> this nice Flucati rug. It is a nice Flucati rug. I know. Uh, you know, your, your other books, West of Here, All About Lulu, uh, the last one, The Revised Fundamentals of Caregiving, all wonderful books. This one, I find each one of them has its own little world. Harriet Chance was a person I just jumped right in with. Different kind of protagonist for you. Why don't you start with Harriet? Where did she come from? Well, um, you know, I, I usually like write about marginalized characters somehow, and, it, it, you know, I, I, it's hard to think of a, a, a group or a demo that's more marginalized than 80-year-old women in this country. You know, I mean, they, 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 they probably have more disposable income than any generation still, but nobody markets to them, uh, nobody programs to them, nobody's even paying attention to them except, you know, health care. And uh, I wanted to, I, I just wanted to write about a, an every woman of the, the greatest generation. She's my mother's age. The book is dedicated to my mom. and. And, 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 you know, to a large degree, the relationships in the book between the women are informed by the relationships in the women in my life. And um, it came very naturally to me. But I got to say that the first draft of this book was just a, it was a mess. It was, it was stultifyingly bad. It was, I tried to get at Harriet's character from the outside. And it was just, you know, Harriet pads to the kitchen and puts her tea water on to boil and looks out the window. And then Harriet, you know, steeps her tea and sips it and looks at the window and thinks about something again and then you know chapter two it was just when i first tried to deliver the book my agent and my editor and i were all on the phone and everybody was just kind of quiet i needed the money i'm like i was trying to deliver the book and everybody was just like nobody said anything. yeah actually we were a little surprised that you tried to hand it in and and chuck said uh chuck adams my editor at algonquin he goes well i, I just I, I don't like harriet and and i said well, you don't like Miss Daisy either, do you? And then we all kind of thought about that for a minute. And then my agent Molly said, she goes, yeah, but Jessica Tandy's performance won us over. And then I had that aha moment that it was up to me. It was up to my, it was like an authorial performance, which that book is. It's kind of a high wire act, you know, but it wasn't that way. It was very linear. Once I broke that linearity and just, uh, you know, I really just started to have fun with it. It just, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled with the book now. I loved writing it, it was so Nobody fun. Nobody talks about your, the writing you don't like as, as entertainingly as you do. You, you frequently talk about books that you've buried in the backyard or couldn't stand or burned. Uh, or you just you, fail so often. I mean, I just wrote my 14th book, which was supposed to publish after Harriet, and uh, the center just didn't hold. I threw it away, you know? I just, you know, I mean, I don't know if my publisher was happy about that because I was supposed to deliver it to them, but I, I was like, I'm sorry, I, I can't. The center didn't hold. I had 16 points of view. I had all these, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I'm trying to, I'm always trying to swing for the fences and, and, and try to develop tools as I write and try to get in over my head because that's where the discovery and the excitement happens. And I succeeded in that, but maybe just a little too much. Uh, and, and so I, I actually threw away the book. You'd think I'd get better at this. Well, you stuck with Harriet, though. What was it about this one that... When I'm going to go back to the, the other one, hold? too, eventually like, What's the I'll difference when the center holds and the center doesn't? I mean, you didn't give up on this one. This something pulled you through. Yeah, the character. I mean, th this one had a focus. I just had to, I had to get at the character from the inside out and, 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 and frustrate the linearity of the narrative to get there. With the other one, I had 16 limited points of view. I had, like, I had uh, themes of, like, schizophrenia, global conspiracy, country music, commercial logging. I mean, it was just, yeah. it was a lot. It was this... And there was some and some really great writing in it I was happy with, and it, it just ultimately it just didn't, you know. I guess I I didn't come till the thesis too too late in the game, you know. I mean I I, I had all this I had all the ancillary stuff figured out, but I, I really hadn't figured out what I was trying to say with the book. So now after I threw the whole thing away, it was like ninety thousand words, none of it's left. 
But now I've got, you know, I've got my ping pong table out in the garage is basically just one huge sheet of paper now and I'm making maps and I've, I figured out what to do, I'm stripping it down to two points of view and I figured out how to crack the code and I know what it's about now. So I, 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 I didn't totally give up on it, but I, I have to get rid of that old work. It's not like a parts car where, you know, oh, well, people ask, you know, why don't you save it? I mean, maybe you can reuse some of the chapters or you just can't do that. Every fictive landscape, it, I, I feel like it's going to, it, you'll just hit some false notes unless it's all in your head. I mean, there's all pieces and parts that, you know, that you that you sleep with and that you take showers with and you go running with or that you hang in the backyard with. It's there all the time, though. Right, and that's why if I throw it away, the really important stuff's still going to be in there. The rest yeah. of it I'll forget. Whereas if I have the manuscript and I keep looking at it and I'm saying, well, I want to save this or this still works or it just you know it just gets in the way. So yeah. I throw it away. I gave it a you know about six months or a year. I wrote another book in the interim called Mike Munoz Saves the World that I'm thrilled about, that'll publish after this. So I wrote its replacement, basically, and then I decided I wanted to go, I was ready to go back and crack the code on it. Now I'm excited about that. Yeah, and your books um, continue to find audiences in new ways. The Revised Fundamentals of Caregiving, one of my favorites, love the characters in that book, made into a movie. Um, that must have been a fun experience for you with Paul Rudd. Yeah, it was amazing, you know, when Paul Rudd's ostensibly sort of playing you, <laughs> and everybody loves Paul Rudd, everybody doesn't love me. But, you know, it's nice to, uh, I got to, They've been really, Rob Burnett, who's directing and producing it, was, has been really uh, incredibly gracious about involving me, you know, because I didn't write a script, I didn't do anything, but like, you know, they, 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 they had me come down on set and consult a little bit on the caregiving angles, and, and um, he's just been a real open book about it, keeping me posted and stuff like that, because I've exercised, I wasn't gonna be that writer that was like, oh, but it's not like that in the book, you right. know? I was going to be the writer that bought a hot tub, you know? <laughs> I think it's going to be great. Did you know, I mean, when you went down there, I mean, do you know it's like not yours anymore when you're on the set? Or do you feel like, hey, hey, you know? I, you know, it's weird. It's kind of abstract. Hot tub, I, I've removed myself from it. Uh, but Rob always made me feel like, I mean, he do always, he's always said this is our journey, you know? I mean, he was, he's just really gracious that way. And I, I said from the beginning, this is, this is yours, run with it. I think he made great decisions. I mean, the dictates between a 300-page novel in a two-hour movie are so different. I mean, how can you expect to really do any book justice? Yeah. It has to be different, and I think the decisions he made were pretty brilliant. I mean, like, I, I, I'm, I'm happy with it. I think the tone and spirit of the book are there. You know, it may not be just like the book, but I don't care. I don't think the best adaptations are, usually. Yeah. When do we, see, when do we get to see the movie? I, you know, I, I, I don't, I think maybe Sundance next year is when it, it'll kind of... Oh, excellent. Down. Let's go back to Harriet really quick. Um, you know, did the idea for Harriet start with the idea that you want to do this tribute for your mother or it came with that age? Is that where it started or did the character come to you in a different way? Well, I mean, I wanted, to, I wanted to write from a female POV. You know, that's the way I do, the, the reason I do this and the reason I wrote eight books before anybody published them and is because I want to become a more expansive person. I just think that writing fiction is the greatest empathic window ever invented, you know? And, and so I got to crawl up inside a 79 year old woman and live in her for a while and see, that sounds kind of lewd actually, but, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and uh, you know, see what that was like. And I have so much experience with, uh, you know, elderly women. My mom is 79, the book is dedicated to her. Um, I just wanted to be inside. Uh, uh, the head of a 79 yeah. year old woman. Yeah, I, I agree with you on the empathy part. I wish more people, I mean, I think that's the pathway. I mean, you know, we see these books and these other cultures, these other lives. Um, there's so much to be learned by, as a writer, certainly, from diving into someone's head and writing from their perspective. But as a reader, being able to sort of dive in and, and learn about somebody is wonderful, too. Yeah, like, I'm, I, I try not to be very authorial, you know. Like, you know, Nabokov talked about his characters as his galley slaves, you know what I mean? Like, he just moved them around to his purposes. And yeah. He was this taskmaster, and with me, I think it's the opposite. I think I, I create a character lovingly, uh, fairly, with contradictions and problems, and this is their life, and this is this is their idealized life, and everything in between is just this great obstacle course. But I sort of let them, I just set them loose in the fictive landscape and really kind of follow them. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you create something with enough will, it actually is just as alive as any carbon-based life form. I mean, Harriet has a will, and um, she, she, she led me. And, and that's what I think is so great about the experience for me. I've tried writing with outlines before. I worked as a screenwriter for a while, and it was just, it was stultifying to me to, to feel trapped. Like, there was no room for discovery. It was just like, I have to hit this story beat, I have to hit that story beat. I like it when my characters surprise me and, you know, teach me. You talked about being a screenwriter at one point. You were also a musician. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 
I was a singer in a punk band. Yourself for, yeah. That's right. But we got an was, album coming out. It's like a 35 years later. Pretty impressive musician. You were in a scene in the Pacific Northwest that was pretty hot and happening at the time, starting with the grunge movement at the moment. But um, but but your life as a musician has affected your writing to some degree. There's sort of a rhythm to it. You sort of go with it. You sort of like you know, it feels very jazz-like to me when I'm reading that's, your books. You count Basie, man. I mean, that's what I want. I'm not. I don't really like to work my sentences a lot. You know, I'm not. There's a time to be lyrical and a time to, you know, to ju I, 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 I just want my prose to swing. You said it, jazz. I mean, like Count Basie. I got Count Basie in my head. I just want it to swing. I want it to be buoyant and fun and, and swing, and I want it to honor the story and the characters. I don't want to call attention to myself, you know. I mean, I get sick of reading fiction where it's like, you know, somebody's eating an apple and walking across the parking lot and it's their thoughts are a smoky chiroscuro of you know it's just <laughs> like you know is it the, you know if you're standing on the great divide and your father just died in your arms okay that's the time to be lyrical but otherwise i just you know i just want it to swing i want it to i want it to read effortlessly and i want to get out of the way and let the reader own the narrative do you like jam to music while you're writing or do you just like gotta go sit quietly somewhere and just like let yeah, it happen? I can't have, I have to have silence. Nice. I can't even write with, the, I got two young kids now and so yeah. I have to go out to the cabin and write three days a week and then the rest of the time I don't even bother trying. But you know, I'm always cogitating like as I walk the baby or the dogs, I'm yeah. thinking about it. But uh, I, I gotta have silence. You cogitate out loud though. One of the things I love about your social media I can't platform. edit myself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it's right there. I get to see the struggles, I get to see the pain, I get to see the thrown away manuscript, I get to see the, the, the movie set pictures, I get to see the successes. You just lay it all out there, man. It's I'm all just happening. a hot mess, dude. Yeah. I don't have any control. <laughs> it's actually one of the reasons I write is because I can edit myself and because I can, you know, back up and slow down. I have a hard time slowing down. I'm manic, dude. I was up till 4.30 in the morning, two days in a row. I've had like six hours sleep in two days. Listen to me. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> it's the Johnny that I know, though. Yeah. And the book is This Is Your Life, Harriet Chance, a great new addition to your list of great books. Really cool to have you on PBS set, oh, too. Man, great thank to you have you so it. much. Great yeah. seeing you. We'll talk again. Thanks.